Who saw the booth for the New Hampshire Liberty Lines? On the recently elected board of member, Mr. Shrek. Thank you. Thank you. So we are the largest citizens watchdog group in New Hampshire. We'd like to say we're actually the United States. Prove me wrong, I don't care. But I'll say it. But um, we actually read every single bill. It's a voluntary effort. It takes hundreds and hundreds of hours. It's 900 bills this year. Uh, we read them all, we rate them all, we actually get people up in front of the committees. On voting day, session day, every Wednesday at the State House, we pass out the gold flyer. It's the gold standard. You see all the reps, they, they pull it out, they look at it, they know we're watching them. And then once a year, after sessions are over, we come out with a report card. We actually grade them. We say, hey, you're a threat to liberty. Or you're a pro-liberty. Or you didn't show up. What are you doing? So like I said, it's a, it's a large volunteer. We're always looking for help. It's mostly internet-based. If you want to get involved, we have training. We train you how to read the bills, read the bills, look at the bills. We train you how to go up. Uh, testify a committee, and if you really get mad, we we'll might help you get elected. My name is Skip Murphy. I'm the founder of BrandonRock.com. We like to consider ourselves to be from here to lead conservative blog site. We have a lot of biting commentary. We also do a lot of YouTube. We go to a lot of these political events. And in fact, we're live streaming right now over the internet, and we are getting I have a video right now which will be posted up later on. So for those of you who can't get to different events, we try to. We also try to put up everything. So you're not just caught by the mainstream press putting up the 30-second sound bites on TV or just a couple of column inches in the paper. Uh, we try to also do the citizen uh, activism and try to help people figure out how do we run, where do we run, and at the level. How do we take care of elected officials who aren't acting too well? Um, my, my name is Jerry Galanis. I'm the uh, chairman of the Grand State Patriots Liberty PAC, also uh, the organizer of the Rochester Night Ball Group, which is one of the largest in the state. Certainly one of the most active. We put a lot of people in the state legislature and one of the state senate this last election cycle. And uh, we do a lot of training, uh, educating, and uh, uh, do uh, a lot of activism around the, around the state to uh, try to motivate people to run for office and also uh, to make older people fire when they do run for office. And, to, and also, my wife is one of those people who got angry enough to did run for office and got elected in the last session. Hey folks, my name is Bob Dwyer. I'm from the sister state to the south, Massachusetts. I'm also the president of the Mass RPA, which is short for the Liberty Preservation Association of Massachusetts. So we have to shorten that. Um, I really respect what the NHLA is doing. I'd like to try to emulate that in Massachusetts. It's, it's a huge effort. We're, we're trying to build our organization and become more effective in Massachusetts. Uh, we did kill the pandemic bill, I don't know how many people are familiar with that, so we kind of cut our teeth up on Beacon Hill and, you know, we, we killed a very bad piece of legislation. We hope to do more up on Beacon Hill and steer them in the right direction. So, um, anyone from Massachusetts, look us up, Mass LPA, get involved with our organization. Uh, my phone number is on the website everywhere, so feel free to call. Thanks. Is this one yours or yours? Hi, I'm Mike Rogers, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I'm here to try and help reduce the uh, size, cost, and burdens of uh, effects of government, and to elect the people that are going to do the best they can to make that happen. That means working at all levels, as uh, Tim O'Neill famously said, all politics is local, so the thing we have to do is to think globally and act locally. We send what we assume to be angels to Washington, they often turn out to be otherwise. We also need to send bulldogs to state government to stand up for our rights. And that's really what this conference has been about. Helping the state government to defend our rights against the of the federal government. Now we've got a bunch, we have a bunch of great people here, and we have great respect for the 10th Commandment Center and the work they're doing, and uh, I'm just glad to be able to help a little bit.
myself as Howard Wilson. I'm the vice chair for the Libertarian Party here in New Hampshire. I'm a candidate both past tense for the U.S. House and in 2012 as well. Too many of the problems that originate theoretically at the state level are imposed on us by our benevolent federal government, including our president, who are born in the United States, our money, which is farmed out to unconstitutional agencies. So yes, we will try and we will fight, and hopefully, one of these days, we'll actually have individuals who don't stick their finger in the air before they vote on particular issues. Um, my name is Jeff Chester. I host a radio show called The Hampshire Perspective. Um, I used to be a police officer, because I don't hold that against me. I also served in the U.S. Army. Um, I basically came to be a, a, a conservatarian, a conservative libertarian. I've created new animals all day today, so I want to continue. Um, and basically, when I decided to put the show together, I put the show together because it wasn't getting out there. The message was lost. And there wasn't a show for local New Hampshire people to talk about their values as it relates to the real New Hampshire. So I was, uh, I was pleased to be able to put that show together. And uh, if you haven't heard it, I hope you listen to it. But if you have heard it, you know that um, basically you can tell that I'm a policeman. Um, it ends up being like an interrogation at the end. And uh, hopefully we open, it at, open up enough questions and get enough answers that make us start thinking about where we need to go next. Thank you, the Honorable uh, House Education Committee. Um, one of the NHL members that was not doing this dance right here. Uh, you may have noticed a number of us. Um, there was Tammy Simmons, there were a number of other reps in this, in this room today walking around. Uh, we are making changes in the State House. Um, it is not the same house it was two years ago. Um, so, whether it's Second Amendment rights, whether it's homeschooling rights, it doesn't matter. It is time to start reducing the size of school government. Um, feel free to contact any of us. Um, there's a number of us that are out there. Um, our email addresses are on the website of the General Court. Thank you. I'm supposed to be the moderator for this, and I will first start off with does anyone have a question for anybody up here? Otherwise, I have plenty of questions for this guy. Yes.
Uh, it's currently, again, it's constitutional committee. It will mandate a review of every federal grant that New Hampshire accepts. A review of the constitutional
is we're going to continue to lose credibility around the world. We've already lost it with China and Russia. They're not using our currency when they do business between one another. The other is, is Japan right now, with the, with the horrific problems they've had over there. They're the third largest purchaser of our federal debt. When that, when that debt, they put buying it because they need to rebuild their country. What's going to happen to those treasuries? We are in serious trouble. And the blessing, though, is out of this is that New Hampshire has elected conservatives to the state legislature and we have take, retaken the state senate. And that is going to give us a firewall between that out of control spending of our federal government. And it's whether or not our, our legislature and our state senate is going to have the backbone to stand up to the pressure that's coming from Washington. Because we certainly will not be able to bail out the debt that they've been pushing us into. Jerry. Thanks. Where's the soapbox? Real quick, Skip. Uh, the reality is this. Um, how many of you see the continuing resolutions? You heard the continuing resolutions that they voted on this, this week and a couple weeks ago, right? Guess what? The reason why we're voting on those continuing resolutions, we didn't have a budget last year. We can't stop the continuing resolutions because we didn't have a budget last year. How many of you notified your president, your senator, and your House of Representative member and said, you haven't got a budget. What do you think you're going to spend next year? How many of you did that? Show of hands. A couple of you? Very good. That's, that's really what it comes down to. Hey, Mike, real quick. Yeah, I'll make this real quick. So, a few years ago, I read an excellent article from Forbes on why it appears to be that no matter how much money you create over here, currency doesn't collect. But the bottom line is that people in worse places around the world have been collecting our dollars and stuffing them in mattresses, figuratively speaking. As soon as the people around the world really get the idea that perhaps our currency and our debt isn't worth what we say it is, that piece of string that they're currently, currently pulling on, this team of attention that's holding up the value of the dollar, is going to go into reverse. You're actually pushing on a piece of string? Well, that's what's going to happen to our dollar if we keep hurting it and they don't stay. Okay, we have another question. Uh, yes, just to uh, address the gentleman on the end of the, uh, the paycheck and the deductions. Uh, it is my intention that if we do something like that, the federal government will simply print more money to replace that which they don't have and just exacerbate the situation, if anything. Thank you. Um, I don't know that that's recoverable, I'll be honest. And I'm speaking for me personally um, on my perception of what's going on down at Capitol Hill. Okay, and I equate to the patients come in to the ER room and we're basically dead on arrival. Um, <clears throat> where we can work is in Concord. Concord, patients come into the ER room and then it's going to require a substantial amount of surgery to recover, but I believe the patient can recover. Um, <clears throat> it's back to kind of basics. Learn how to take care of, you've heard food today, you've heard taking care of family, you've heard um, Making sure you have sound monetary policies and budget policies at home, that's where you have to start. Okay, another question over here. Uh, a question about, uh, I guess, state police. Like, I'm from Connecticut and we have state police. The sheriff system has long been gone. How do we get control of the police? Basically, the police are working for the government. They're not as connected to the people as, say, a sheriff system would be. Is there another mechanism, or do you have to try and get the sheriff system reinstated? What are some thoughts out there and ideas about that? Well, as a former police officer, I'm going to share a couple other secrets with you. Not only was I a former police officer, but I was the president of my police officer's union. I know, and, and uh, you should prove me, because uh, I will tell you, I took no money near the end of my career. My last negotiation was my last negotiation when I suggested that we should be co-paying for our insurance and we should not be asking for a raise in the early 90s because the recession had hit and that was my last negotiation as president. I, I think that it's a matter of principle. For you though, um, there's a real good element that you can do for state police. You have control of your legislators and your governor. Demand that they put a, a civil body together that oversees the state police, and that part of that civil body would also have at least one member that sits on the negotiations for their contract. And push
push that and get more and more people to do that. It's hard to reinstate the sheriff uh, element, though. Any other questions? Um, if you take away the, and close down the federal reserve and take away the money, they're going to have to cut the, the budget because if, if they have no fake money to play with, you know. Well, right now, that's let's face it. We are borrowing 40 to 43 cents for every dollar that we are spending. Whether we have a Fed or not, we are going to run out of money. So the budget will have to be cut. And that goes to one of the questions I hope I can get into before uh, this panel finishes. The, the thing is, um, this country would probably be better off if the economy crashed right now. Because we will still be here. We're still going to be growing our food. This is going to be Whether these people want to play with their fake money, well, because it's, you know, you're, you're going to be wiping your butt with this stuff real quick. I've heard, I've heard a new philosophy recently, and uh, it comes from a very well respected friend of mine in Massachusetts. He's, he's, he's got some bugs, but he says, you know, give them as little as you possibly can, like you said, but take everything they're willing to give, because the sooner the system crashes, the sooner we can rebuild it. Because it's in the federal government, the debt is it's ir irreparable. I remember um, back in the early 90s, I had a roommate who was a history, sorry, history major, he eventually became a professor, um, and he said it took about 200 years for a democracy to realize it could both himself money, and it would fly. Guess where we are now? Graduate services, uh, we have reached the point of graduate services, we have realized that we can vote to ourselves uh, for the federal trial. The federal government, if within its constitutional bounds, would be about 20% of its current size. We need to rescind most of the federal programs, not to put starving old people on the streets, but to return, devolve those programs to the states. If the money was block granted to the states and then gradually tapered off, and the states gradually tapered up their taxes, what you would end up with is 50 experiments with what welfare should look like, and all of it would be local. And then it would be up to the people of the states how much pay they were willing to stand for how much benefits they wanted. Meanwhile, the federal government should be restricted to its original very small role, in which case it's much harder for it to get out of control. One last comment before we go to the next question. Have you ever run for office in town? Excellent. I am an elected budget committee member in my town, and we went from double digit increases every single year to nothing. Flat budgets over the last couple of years. The only way to really answer your question is to get out of your chair, get off the couch, run, get elected, and go, guess what? You have to deal with me now. And you have to recruit your friends who think the same way. And then eventually, those folks that now consist of the farm team are going to rise up, get to the state legislature, and then hopefully send them on to Congress. It's going to take a while, but it starts here, and it starts with all the people. That's the practical side. Next question. Jeff, Jeff was telling us that uh, we need to live free or die. I don't see freedom coming anytime soon. I don't want to die. Do you have any suggestions for us in previous to what we can do to get involved in ourselves? Um, Dan, maybe you talk about the NHLA and the other organizations. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to It's a mostly internet. If you have a spare auto, it will be definitely easier. Um, you build train with auto to read bills. Um, the process on the website is an interview. So you become owner of that bill. You read the bill, you read what law is changing, and then you answer questions that the website asks you. And at the end of that, we take that information, we have data, we use that data to decide what committees we have to show up on. I think one other thing too is to answer that question. It's amazing the power of a pack. And I don't mean a political action committee, I mean a pack of wolves. We need to stop being the sheep, and I'm going to share an example with you. Um, if you don't know Jerry Delimus and his group, the 912 group out of Rochester, you've got to meet this group because they are a power to be reckoned with. This past week, this group got online, got on the phone, and complained about the fact that their representative in Washington was not representing them. By the end of the week, that representative personally called Jerry 
and some other conservative activists and said, please, I beg of you, let me talk to you. It's amazing what the power of a pack will do. If you're not in one, get in one. Be the vicious sheep. Don't be the um, woeful wolf. Yes. I would uh, urge all of you to, uh, to look around and see if you, if you join a 912 group or a Tea Party group or some uh, liberty-based group uh, within your area. If there's not one start one, if there's a Republican committee, take your people in there. If it's not running right, take it over. They're very easy. I've done it. That's, and, and put in liberty-minded people in charge of that. And then you can run right up to your county and you can actually go right to the uh, chair of the GOP in the state of New Hampshire that's pushed hard enough. But you need to educate. You need to become active. You, and and it, i got to tell you, and I'm telling you by experience, it'll take a lot of your time. You will basically not have a whole lot of free time left if you want to be successful at it. But the urgency is it, it is, is immeasurable. We're, we're sending our young over to fight and die in Afghanistan or Iraq, and yet we won't get off the sofa or put up with some stupid meeting that we don't want to be at and listen to some louder coming out with some fool. And, and so we won't, work, we won't run for that office to replace them. But yet we've got guys sleeping over in, in dust bowls, mud bowls, uh, get shot at. And so we have, we have no right to complain whatsoever if we, and that's we is us looking in that mirror, do not have the courage or, or, or love of country enough to do that. And, and I would urge you, I'm a former Marine, so uh, part of my problem is, is I never know when to quit because quit is not a part of the, uh, of the uh, of, of, I won't give up my time either. But make sure that you do. You can go to the pack over there, pick up my card, I'll help you start a group if you don't have one. There's no charge, no nothing. And, 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 and search the internet. You can always uh, uh, Google uh, 912 groups or Tea Party groups if you don't know of any, which you guys probably already do. But get active and get a group together. Start one at home. It's about to echo Jerry when he said it all. Uh, get active, get your Tea Party folks into positions of power in the local Republican committees, and start to push your favorite candidates. That is how you can make a difference. With 400 members in our state legislature, you can own one or two state maps. Make sure you do. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Wait a oh, Hi. 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 Um, if you'd like me back up a little bit, I'll try. The, um, Steve King uh, of Iowa um, came up with a number in around 2,000 Americans a year. A little louder for us, man. Around 2,000 Americans a year are dying at the hands of illegal aliens. Um, call them undocumented workers, call them illegal aliens, call them refugees. There are a lot of good people who are, are trying to come here illegally. Um, like I said, this is going to be all over the place. Um, Thomas Jefferson wrote in the third paragraph of the Declaration that safety with a capital S and happiness was a primary concern for the founders. I also recently read um, a quote of his regarding to rapid immigration. I also read online that apparently Mr. Obama wants to bring 80,000 refugees from Somalia to, to our country. What I'm concerned about, it, it, it appears that what the socialists are trying to do is to dilute the voter base with persons who don't understand our system of government, which is from the bottom up. Is there anything that we can do through our representatives to make sure that John Lynch doesn't allow more persons into the state of New Hampshire, or is that something that he does without going through the red, to the legislature to allow more people coming in and to dilute the voter base who don't understand our system of government? I, I think that in this particular issue, there's nothing that the states can actually do for this. Maybe somebody here will correct me. Fine. But I would almost disagree with that. Um, and I mean, um, when the Confederacy lost the Civil War, um, the United States Congress forced each new, each of those states to reinstitute their constitutions, and they had to rewrite them and send them to Congress to approve. Texas actually had the Department of Immigration in their constitution. They controlled their borders, and it was approved 
by the U.S. Congress. So that the mechanism is there and it is in place if we push it. Congressman King is, is the, the best patriot we have ever had in the House right now. He comes on my show all the time. And if you were to get behind him and support him, that's a man who's going to push through legislation that's going to force these governors from one end, and then if we get with our representatives on this side and accept that legislation, we'll come at it from both ends. It certainly has been the case in Britain that that rapid assimilation just hasn't happened with all of their rapid immigration. And you bring up a very valid point. There's another way to address this, and there's at least one bill in this year to do that, which is you can't control them coming across the border, but you can control what rights and obligations you have to them. So there's there's a domicile bill in there this year to address voting rights. Um, I know a bunch of college students got upset at how it was drafted the first time, but there is a way to start to address this to make sure that the people who are in the state are actually residents here. Um, I know of at least one case where we may have a state rep who wasn't even a resident, who, who didn't meet the two-year um, constitutional requirement, who is now serving. So we need to make sure people are being held accountable to the Constitution, and a domicile requirement for voting may be a reasonable first step to approach to deal with this issue. If, 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 if I may, I, if, if, if I may be on board, well, this old lady was graciously giving the microphone, yeah, I've also noticed in the Declaration, I'm sorry, the Constitution, Article 1, there's no prohibition of a state uh, stopping the state from enforcing federal law, which is basically what the Arizona law is. Um, I've come to these conclusions knowing that over the course of mankind that uh, Karen, I hate talking, <laughs> that uh, tyrannical tyrants and despots have been the norm and an experiment for persons to govern themselves is in their way is from the moment of the birth of the Declaration of Independence they've been trying to tear it down. Thanks for putting up with me. Mike, you have... Uh, in Massachusetts, we're launching an initiative that uh, requires that you have to show an ID to vote. I know that doesn't completely eliminate uh, you know, these uh, non-citizens from voting, because you can get a driver's license in Massachusetts, even if you're not a citizen. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, some people say it it's really goes against the libertarian principle to force people to show an ID. But, uh, you know, we don't live in a society anymore where everybody knows their neighbor that goes to vote. So anybody can come in. And we've all heard reports on, uh, you know, people showing up from the border towns, from uh, out-of-state plates voting. Uh, you know, so we think that this is a good initiative to at least, um, you know, show that there is a problem, there is voter fraud, and that, you know, we only want American citizens or state citizens to uh, have the right to the ballot. So that's one thing we're trying to do in Massachusetts. I'd just like to quickly address the question on, uh, on illegal immigration. And I've got family in Arizona, and the invasion down there it is totally an invasion happening there, and in, in uh, Texas especially, and I'm originally from California, happening there as well. And under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, the last paragraph, they have to listen to this kind of carefully. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops, or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war, unless, unless, actually invaded, or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. I sent that to uh, uh, Governor uh, Brewer in Arizona just before she put in SB 1070. And I thought, what if, what if she said, you know what, I'm going to declare war on Mexico. Their invasion of us is, is, is actually subsidized by their government. And just put it out. Even if she doesn't do it, but put it out to get some attention to what was going on. She had SB 1070 working on it at any rate. Because it is a war. I and mean, if you go down on that border, it's a war. 
And I would just, I would just say that we could fall back onto the Constitution on that because our states are, what we do is we look at the federal government for our protection. It's not for our protection. It's our rights given to, granted to the state government, granted to the federal government by the states. We, we have a fallback at our border of our state to defend our state against anybody. Even the federal government, we have that right. And that's a constitutional claim. We hope to help them against that, Jerry. Um, I have a quick quote for Bob. Do you think we could defeat Barney Frank if we had to prove who we were to vote? <laughs> Just a thought. So, so Skip, you spoke about running for office, right? I'm at a multiple conference down in Mass last year, um, Masso. And the lady said, I'm in Barney Frank's district. I don't know what to do. I can never defeat him. He said, run as a Democrat. Run as a moderate Democrat who's pro-family. You'll get to throw tar on him the entire campaign. Okay, you won't win, but you can point out all his weaknesses. Okay, I run four times for three times for a state rep, once for a state senate. I got in once. Why did I run? It wasn't to get up here. I got better things to do with my time than be in the state house three days a week, some weeks. Okay, I ran so I could hold those who are in office accountable. It's not that much work to get your name on the ballot. It's two bucks. Run. And then when you, when you're, if you don't win, you don't put a shine into the campaign. When you call up the rep who did win, your voice is going to get heard. Any other questions? I had a question, actually. And then I was wondering, um, I've had a couple of questions from people on how long we're supposed to run the questions and answers. Well, the answer to that is when I looked at the sheet, there were okay. two question marks at the end of the time slot. Oh, well, so open and answers. So okay. they're open ended. Okay. Well, Until, I, unless I, uh, everybody here leaves, and then these guys start walking off the stage. Okay. Well, I have one question, and this is. So, 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 yeah, so the, the, the morning okay. the morning up time is 6 o'clock. Uh, so we can okay. keep going until a few minutes of 6 if, uh, if you've got questions. But Great. Uh, when you want to ask questions, we run out of time. Okay. My question is to Dan about the NHLA. I'd like to know about how you go through the process of analyzing the legislators to give them their state, the um, ratings that they're giving them, and then what happens with them after that. I mentioned before um, whether or not they read the notes, we do. So we know what's in them. We know if they're pro liberty or anti liberty, and we rate them on it. New Hampshire's been a very open government. We have all the roll calls. We're there in the committees. We know. I think we actually have allies on every committee now. So um, it's just a big spreadsheet that one. No, the report card is the accountability. Um, the report card is actually printed in the Union Leader, I believe, every single year. Um, and these legislators who don't read the bills are hungry for the information that we give them on Wednesday. We see them every single week with this yellow card on top of their stack that's sometimes two inches tall. Because they need to know, they want to know, they're hungry to know what the preliminary position is, especially with the last election. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the last question um, as far as law enforcement and invasion. Um, Article 1, Section Clause 15, to provide for the common fourth militia to execute the laws of the land, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. So your, your, your problems are that you don't have a militia. Therefore, the law enforcement and the federal laws have been usurped, and you don't have an organization to deal with illegal immigration. So Clause 15 addresses both problems, if you have a militia. Well, um, you need to stop being a rebel, my friend. <laughs> you need to stop being a rebel. I mean, that really, we say that out loud. If you've ever said that to your neighbors, what is the problem with having a state militia? And, we, we, and I know we have a bill, I know Dan has tried to bring it before. There's nothing wrong with having a state militia, especially when you consider this one fact. At any point, our National Guard can be called up by the federal government, removed from our state, and then what do we have? We have nothing to help us. So uh, another state militia is absolutely appropriate and necessary, not just in New Hampshire, but in every state. He's great, yeah. He's fabulous. And uh, so, um, as a consequence of that, I talked to our local uh, sheriff in Grafton County, and he said that to form a militia now, you almost have, they have so many regulations. I'm assuming, because 
kind of like state regulations, yet they almost have to be um, law enforcement. Now, now you, you, a state can enact a state militia within their borders. Absolutely, especially in a state like New Hampshire. And answerable only to what the legislation feels they should be answerable to. Well, I understand from talking with the Sheriff of Powell that I, if I took a course, say, from the NRA, and I was interested in becoming a militia woman, that I, I would be helpful. I think you would have to take some of the things like part time or something like that. No, that's not necessary. Um, and the bill that Dennis has put in which I think has been retained in committee, I don't remember, I hear bills later or something, but it could be a completely voluntary effort on the part of a number of citizens. It does not need to be a paid militia at all. And I think the problem is this, is that when you say militia, when you're in that, that dinner party with your friends, and they hear that, they get scared. And they're like, oh my goodness, a bunch of rebels are running around my, my street. And they, and they think that that state militia is somehow going to be used against them. But what we have to do is be good at conveying our message. Imagine if you're sitting in your house and you're near a river and a flood happens. 75% of the National Guard troops are now gone in New Hampshire. Some are coming back. Who is there to help you? A militia is just not an army that finds itself on a hill prepared to defend against an invasion. A militia is an army that also knows how to use sandbags, that knows how to bail water, that knows how to be there for their neighbors. That's the definition of a militia. Okay. Right now, there's a lot in other states about certainty to community and emergency response. Is that a problem? Right. And, and it sounds like if we're counting a cert team, it doesn't have the who frightening militia sound. And it does exactly the same thing. Yeah, it, it does, and I think it, those are the little tricks, and I don't want to call them too much tricks, but those are the little things that you have to subtly um, use to get things in place to help your neighbors out, but get your neighbors involved, I agree with that, and the name's, the name's a little bit different, but if that's the avenue we have to take, we do have to take it. Um, I think it's long overdue that we had state militias again. Uh, the certain community, emergent community, emergency response team, or CERT team. That's just marketing. Yeah. There, when we had the bad floods and the bad ice storms, okay, back several years ago, when the National Guard was called out to help with the floods and with those washed out roads and down trees and wires, those guys aren't here anymore. Let's be honest. Those, those are our neighbors and our friends, and they're not here. They're in Afghanistan. Um, we need to replace them with volunteers who know how to use a chainsaw and know how to how to put a sandbag and how to direct traffic because it may be just as simple as making sure the cars go on the right roads because this road is washed out. Any other questions? All right, one turn. Oh, one more. Thank you very much, General. It's been very interesting and informative day. I uh, recently read newspaper reports of uh, Speaker O'Brien and the uh, Republican uh, leadership in the House uh, changing the makeup of committees on the same day as uh, the committee hearings are being held. In fact, there may have been some incidences of the makeup of the committee being changed after the hearing has started. Uh, would anybody here like to comment on that, please? I can speak to that. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is a long-standing practice of making sure that the committee is fully filled. And this is not just a Republican thing. This has been going on for years. Okay? So if you only have 11 members in a committee that's 17 people, and you want to vote on this, even after public testimony, or, uh, during the executive session, where the bill is actually being made amongst the committee members, it has been a common standing practice to put other people back in, in the same proportion. So if um, you're adding four Republicans, you're adding one Democrat as well, make sure it's in proportion of being kept. But this is not an unusual or new practice. Thank you. Another question behind you. Thanks for coming in, sir. Thank you all very much. I have uh, two questions. The first is, um, does anyone know if it's possible to legally withhold 
any of the federal tax monies that are taxed for New Hampshire citizens that are destined for the federal government in order to stop them and essentially use that money ourselves. And a comment was made before that some $16 billion is taxed from New Hampshire every year and $10 billion goes to the federal government and $10 billion comes back and another $3 billion of ours is used for federal projects. Is there any way to prevent some of that money from going to the federal government in the first place? Uh, changing your elected representatives is the first step to change those types of laws. I mean, uh, other than I mean, for right now, I mean, from the state well, level to prevent some of the federal government. That's a great question. Jeff, you go first. There, there are states right now that are, are enacting laws that they would be the collectors of the federal tax. And then when they look at the whole bill, they say, guess what? This is what we think we owe you. And then they return the remainder money back to their people. Now, let's face it, folks. We, we have a big giant in front of us. And that's why I told the story of David and Goliath. We, we, we have a behemoth in front of us. And it really is going to take one or two states getting together this cross communications of saying, Montana, we love what you're doing. New Hampshire's a perfect state for that. Let us try it. And then you have two states. And then we go to another state like South Carolina that thinks like us and say, what do you think of this? Educate them. And then we have three states. And what we found out is that when you get 26 states saying no to Obamacare, or it's more now, it's amazing how the federal government reacts. But uh, we can have that kind of power. We just have to push our legislators. Absolutely. We may not go like it. Uh, a couple of years ago, the gentleman was running for governor of uh, Georgia. Uh, he had a, a great platform, which is pretty much what you just said, which is that uh, my legislature shall review federal, the federal budget and determine which parts are constitutional. We shall interpose and collect the taxes, and we shall remit only those monies for programs which are constitutional. All others shall be retained and either find, used to fund programs locally or returned to the people. And that's what, that was his actual platform for Georgia First, and they slimed him, they invented a sex scandal, ran the guy out of the race. So, uh, you're going to make me stay angry, but it's the right approach. Next question. Oh, go ahead, one more. Um, I've read some stuff about the uh, free man movement and the United States being a corporation and admiralty law and all this stuff. Is anyone up here familiar with this? No, if this is real, no, if this is actually legal. Guys, I think we're going to have to take a pass on that. Okay. Any other questions? Federal Reserve? <laughs> Well, yeah, change the, I hate to say it, but a lot of it does come back to we have to change the elected officials, not just coming out of New Hampshire, but getting other like-minded people in other states. And the internet is a great way to cross-pollinate uh, these kinds of ideas. And start that movement. Look what happened this last election cycle with the Tea Party. Two years ago, slightly over two years ago, this was nothing but a fringe movement. Now you look at all the people who have been elected here in Hampshire legislature, you look at all the freshman legislators down in D.C., the big impact that they are already having, and when they don't do right, the Tea Party all over the country starts calling in, melting the switchboard, and they've actually made a big change. In fact, it was, uh, I can't remember the Democrat who said that, but basically there's now three parties down in D.C., Republican, Democrat, and Tea Party. These are people who have woken up and said, just like uh, Jeff said earlier, see that? I dare you to cross that line. And a lot of them are saying, uh, maybe not. And that's where we make the difference. Again, it comes back to the sovereignty of the individual. Our system of government is supposed to be bottom up. For so long, we have said, no, we'll just let the federal government run to the point where one of the protesters outside said, the state should be nothing more than a political subdivision of the federal government. That's not what we think here. How many homeschoolers do we have? Homeschool? Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, um, the reality is, is that this generation right here, 
probably will not see the end of the Fed, probably will not see a balanced budget, probably will not see the deficit completely removed. We've heard the great generation, we must be that new great generation so that our sons and daughters who follow us are ready for that. My son does go to public school, and for any of you who've heard this story, when he come, I go to his school three weeks before school starts, I get his books, I read every single one of them, he goes to school with yellow highlights and post-it notes in every single one of them, he knows exactly what to ask, he knows exactly what to say, and he doesn't mind making a teacher look foolish, and I can't tell you how many calls I have gotten, would you please, please stop this? So the key is, is that generation needs to understand how, and I'm going to say it, how immoral the Fed is. They need to understand it and they need to know, understand how it works. So when they're sitting in that civics class and they go, please explain to me because this is how I understand it. And, they, and that, those kids around there listen to the other kids. And that's how we do it. Let me add this. It's nice not to be the king, but sometimes the moderator. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about getting elected to your local budget committee, to your other select or what have you. One of the things that conservatives have failed to do was to stay involved in the school boards. We have left the education field. We are now reaping what we sow. I have on Granite Rock a, an ongoing recurring thing that I call notable quotes. It is one that I'm going to be putting up because it fits. And it is from Nicholas Lennon. And it says, give me four years and the seeds that I have sown will never be repealed. We have allowed the other side, and I call it the other side because we are in an ideological war be able to take over the educational field. And if you go in and actually ask your kids what is it that they are teaching, you will be horrified. I just, as my uh, most esteemed wife who helps me with this, is now letting me run for the school board because in my town, Amen. I'm going from my budget committee to the school board because I am not like what I'm hearing. I urge all of you to go back. You want to make change? Oh, the gentleman's left. Change the Fed, change the school board. Take exactly. it back, like they did in Texas with the school books, and then you get to figure out and understand and then say, this is what we're be taught. Right, there is no more powerful position in this country, I don't care what anyone says, than the school board. They represent over 50% of your city budget, they decide the curriculum for your children, and they decide every fate that that city wants to activate that year. You listen to me first, and then what's ever left over, you get to have the rest. We control the school board, and we control so much. If you're ever going to run for an office, run for school board. Not president, not Congress, not Senate, not House. Run for school board. And if you need my help, or if you need Jerry's help, or if you need anyone's house help here, let us know, and that army will be there. Because school board is the key. And we will come out, and we will help. Or we'll get somebody to come help you. Other question, please. This is just a plug for the Apple Shrek movie, which is going to be shown in different cities um, on April 15th. You can go on Freedom Works, and there is a place to demand that they show Apple Shrek in your community. And this movie is going to be electrifying because a lot of people in school do not read out the shirt before and we are living it. So I recommend everybody try to see this and go ahead and the show you I just want to know that Alice Shirt's out. You know, five theaters in the Boston area and uh, we get the support, we might actually take Boston out there. I'm going to recommend a short film that you might find fun. A lot of people say, how do we get rid of the Fed? Well, one of the ways you do it is to educate. And there's some great books out there. G. Edward Griffith, if I've got his name right, the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. It's a wonderful book. It's a detective novel. It's also nearly two inches thick. Uh, most people fall asleep reading it. Uh, there's something out there which I refer to loosely as South Park meets The Creature from Jekyll Island. TheAmericanDreamFilm.com. It's a half hour short. It pretty much encapsulates everything you read in Griffith's book, and you can get it over to your friends and your kids. It's punchy, it's short, and it makes a point. So that's, that's a great piece of education. Can you repeat the name of that one that again? Yeah, I mean, and there's, there's a lot of similar sounding things. So you can you repeat the name of that? Yeah, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of similar sounding films. The American Dream Film Dot Com. Don't put in the word movie. 
waiting. Yeah, another one is, that Tammy brought up was Waiting for Superman. Excellent film. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I certainly agree with that. I'd like to take a step back to education for a minute, just because a bill passed out of the House yesterday which says the following, it amends the, the compulsory attendance statutes with the following sentence, no school district shall compel a parent to send his or her child to any school or program which he or she may be conscious of, conscientiously opposed to, nor shall a school district approve or disapprove a parent education program or curriculum. I'm getting there. We need your help though. Okay, I'm going to ask panel a question is this uh, directly ties in with this. On a Facebook page, there was an ongoing discussion and one person who just thinks this is absolutely terrible said, and I'm paraphrasing here, what is this going back a hundred years to where the children are the chattel of the parents? And the first thought that came to my head was, what? They're now the chattel of the state? And in effect, that's what this person actually believed. That the state government actually should be in charge of the kids. I, I just want to do a rapid response, guys. Your reaction on channel of the parents? Yes. 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 Article 2B, which we put in, right? Parents have the right to control the health, welfare, and education of their children. We didn't get it through this set. This year, we're going for it again. And one of the things that came out as a presser was that Representative Dave Bates, who's a co-sponsor of this, or the prime sponsor, I forget which, is basically willing to debate Governor Lynchon, who under his governorship decided yeah. that no one can leave school until age 18. Now, it's a lot of it. But it's a very interesting debate, and I would love to see it. Unfortunately, uh, Governor Do Nothing Lynch, I don't think is going to be very bright. Right. Tony Lynch is what I call him. He always seems to come out when the weather's bad. Um, and then he shows up in the flood with his nice boots on his coat. You're right. I, to go back to that question that you asked, though, is that um, I, I think that the answer is this, is that if we help produce smart children, that is the final proof of that we're doing it right. And the end result is, is, as I can tell you, my teachers cannot stand my son most of the time, not because he isn't a good kid, not because he isn't a blessing, because he goes in there and he understands not to regurgitate what I've taught him, but to critically think that if my dad is concerned enough about it, then I should be concerned enough about it. Because in the end, guys, and how many parents do we have still left in this audience? We're pretty darn good people, and we should be proud of that. And we raise really good kids, and we need to have the parents stop thinking that we don't. I'm, I'm a father of five. Uh, I've got three boys and two girls. They're all adult now. My youngest is the Marine Corps. I'm to Afghanistan next week as a Marine. And uh, I'll tell you what I did with my kids. I was down in Connecticut for quite a few years in, uh, on the coast. And I, I spent two hours a night, every night after I formed my own business at the dinner table and going over their, their homework with them. And if they didn't have homework, I gave them homework. My oldest daughter graduated a semester early, early summa cum laude, out of, and a biology major out of college, and Pfizer picked her up, she had to come back from work to graduate, get her degree. She didn't get a single Dean's Award, but she got all the Kim Awards from the college, the first time that had ever happened. And, and, and what the point is I'm trying to make, is don't let that bumper sticker that says my child is an honor student at such and such school impress you. And not even with your own children, unless you're checking their work. Because what they've done is they know that the budgets are tied to kids being a success in, uh, and so they make them all successes. And even when they shouldn't be. Failure is, I mean, Marine Corps says it's not an option, but I'll tell you what, it is a learning curve, and you will learn. And, 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 but if everything that they do is acceptable and hidden from you by good report cards and, and, and bumper stickers that make the parents feel good when they go to the soccer game, is you're failing the children. And that needs to be, you need to really pay attention to that. And also the indoctrination that they get there, check them on some of the issues that they're, that they're, taught, that they're taught in school. Have those conversations with them. If their grandparents talk to their grandkids. Talk to those kids because I'll tell you what is what they are. It's in an indoctrination center. The teachers have gone to uh, teachers' colleges and been taught that same thing. 
That's what they know and what they believe. And they're going to teach your children or grandchildren the very same message. So I just stay on top of that. Just a couple of minor closing remarks. So let's not forget the words of uh, the founders or the words of the famous Ronald Reagan that the states created the federal government, not the other way around. And we don't want to be having that conversation with our children and our grandchildren about what it used to be like when men were still free. Not on our watch. And uh, a friend, a man that I like a lot, Bill McKay, says the same thing. Not on our watch. We're not going to let that happen to us. And I want to thank all of you who stuck it out this long for, for coming and staying. I, but I thoroughly enjoyed this. I hope you have. And I do hope you'll support the 10th Amendment Center. There are four church mics and they need to help. Well, Mike, I have one thing. I was asking for someone who wanted to get a hold of this item. So hold up. No, no, I got two, sorry. So, I came here because I'm a huge fan of Tom, uh, Tom Woods and Jim Batman. So, for Tom Woods, it's obvious, advice book. For Jim Batman, he is my home percent. If you live in New Hampshire, call Congressman Frank Inter. Frank Inter ran on a platform that included the Read the Bills Act. We know how to ask him, who are you going to support the Read the Bills Act, Frank? Folks, I want to say thanks very much for staying to the very end. We appreciate it. And remember, if you learned a lot about Nullify, don't nullify the technology you picked up today. Thank you. And uh, if anyone wants, um, I bring one new constitution from New Hampshire. If anyone would like my copy from tonight, you're welcome to have it. All you have to do is raise your hand. Finally, the edgiest news is always on Granite Rock. Support them. Right. Frank Hinton is having a town hall meeting um, March 30th. You, if you go to his website, you'll see the address that he's having. Uh, I think he needs to see our pretty faces.